Hello, welcome ladies and gentlemen to our Star Tides panel on implementing lasting cross-cutting solutions across silos. This is a topic which flows from the overall theme of this event. Uh, like many other efforts and discussions over this two-day event, we seek to help improve sustainable resilience. Now, first, a little bit of context for those who may not have engaged with the event until this panel. Uh, Star Tides is a community and the name um, start, stands for Sharing to Accelerate Research, that's the first part, and Transformative Innovation for Development and Emergency Support, that's the second part. So when you think Star Tides, think two parts to how we help um, our community. The first is before a crisis, the R&D, the plans and processes to uh, improve our ability to uh, react and respond and recover from a crisis. The tides piece, um, we uh, this, this focuses on the innovation and development to directly support uh, emergency uh, support. Now, in the past, Star Tides has been instrumental in working with numerous real-world events, and that continues to occur today. Uh, Star Tides has helped with um, uh, cyclones, a response to cyclones, response to earthquakes, hurricanes, um, uh, typhoons, and um, just can continually um, uh, works to improve its ability to respond to these large natural disasters. Now, this event, I wanted to say, is aimed to be valuable for the, the entire community of STARS. And this includes uh, individuals from the national security space, uh, human security, emergency management, sustainable development, um, all communities who need to come together to help in emergency response. Again, the topic of our panel, implementing lasting cross-cutting solutions across silos. This panel is going to seek to improve uh, the thought leadership and thoughts and frameworks around improving resilience. Resilience defined here refers to an entity's capacity to prepare for disruptions, to recover from shocks and stresses, and then to adapt and grow from a disruptive experience. So this is all about improving our resiliency before a crisis um, and during a crisis when so many have to come together to respond, um, improving our ability to respond and endure uh, in that crisis, overcoming whatever obstacles there are. Now, um, I'd like to briefly introduce our three panelists and then our format will be uh, we'll be asking each of them to give their comments on this. And then I have some questions I want to ask to pull out some thoughts. First, a little bit about me. I'm Bob Gorley. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of a consultancy called UDA. And I wanted to mention that UDA is an homage to a decision-making process that I think is very relevant to crisis response. UDA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. It's a decision model uh, made famous and created by uh, Colonel John Boyd, a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot, who created that uh, acronym to underscore his decision-making model uh, in combat and also to underscore his lessons from the study of major military operations throughout history. Uh, and it's a model for very dynamic decision-making, like those responding to a crisis may need to employ. Uh, and that's why I wanted to mention uh, the company name of UDA is an homage to this decision model. And it's a model, I think, very relevant to a disaster response. Uh, let me give a brief bio of each of our three panelists, um, and then I'll ask them to uh, give their thoughts. Uh, Declan, Declan Karain is a manager of a, a critically important consultancy, uh, Intelligence in Science. Now, they specialize in science, technology, and R&D. Um, and they help do that across countries, across um, um, mission areas and domains and borders. And he does that in a way that I think the Star Tides community uh, very much appreciates because uh, his development of R&D consortia can help bring focus to much needed areas where we really need to develop more capabilities before a crisis. And, uh, and I also want to introduce Claire Lockhart, uh, Claire is the uh, director and co-founder of the Institute for State Effectiveness. Now, she has a lot of experience with states and um, uh, measures of effectiveness for these states and pulls together this knowledge uh, at the uh, Institute, which I would not call a think tank. I believe it's been referred to as a do tank. Um, let's bring together info and then uh, see what action we need to take. 
Uh, Mike Tanji is a um, experienced executive leader who has worked in government and industry and, and has had a large focus on reducing digital risk and mitigating the risk that comes from um, non-resilient systems, which can be under cyber attack. He currently uh, works uh, with as the chief of staff of the Global Cyber Alliance, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to eradicate systemic cybersecurity risk. This is a tough job, but observing the Global C Cyber Alliance for years leads me to conclude that these guys are making progress. They're finding things to do and they're doing it in measurable ways. Uh, with that as the briefest of introduction, I wanted to ask each of you to speak for a few minutes and first correct my record if I got your bio wrong. Uh, tell us a bit about your organization and tell us your views about um, what you think we should do collectively to help mitigate the risk of um, in, improve our resiliency before a crisis. And uh, Declan, I'd like to turn to you first, please. Bob, hi and congratulations to you on pulling this meeting together i think the timing is is particularly important we've just recently been engaged with the united nations in a process to raise awareness of the role and contribution of science and technology and collaborative research to delivering the un sustainable development goals so this dialogue today i think comes at a, at a very very good time uh, if I, I suppose I just following your introduction, I'd like first of all to speak to the uh, the the uh, silo element, and I absolutely uh, support the orientation of this conversation around the idea of silo breaking, as uh, as I might call it. And so, what what does that mean in 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 this context? Well, to my mind, um, the question of resilience is is critical, as you, as you've outlined. Mm -hmm. So how does one prepare for that? Well, you know, from a general perspective, uh, I'd really like to focus on the contribution of collaborative research and development to delivering resilience capacity building. But of course, I think we have to look at this in, in global terms. And again, coming from the, the uh, UN discussion and dialogue, I think there's a huge urgency to enable global collaborative research and development. Now, I mean that in a, in, a, in a very broad sense, but certainly in key areas which are germane to, to a disaster preparedness. A lot of that comes down to enabling data, data access, data exchange. So I think that's, that's going to be an issue in future. But looking at it in a bit more detail, I think we're looking at a, a data enabled environment for research and innovation. I think how that applies to resilience is something we have to consider but clearly we're looking at a data enabled resilience capacity. And what I think is very important and isn't sufficiently recognized is the fact that this data needs to flow around the world, ideally to wherever these disasters are going to happen or happening or have happened and how we use that data to address the, 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 uh, the challenges. But of course, data, as you probably know, is increasingly becoming under the influence of regulations. In Europe, we have the, general data protection regulation. The state of California has a similar piece of regulation that, that I, I, th I think it's a, a privacy piece of legislation, I, I forget the exact title. And there is a move by a Senator Moran in the US Congress to move a federal piece of legislation. Then you move to other parts of the world and similarly, they're evolving this, this, these, these regulatory environments. So how are these going to impact on this data enabling capability that's going to be very, very necessary. And I think that this has to be understood. Why is that important to understand? Because of course it affects policies. And I think the resilience community needs to be much more active in order to engage with policymakers. But again, arguably, we don't have a global policy community. We have the United Nations, which advances ideas and builds a community of interest but that is not that does not equal legislation it does not equal implementable policy ideally it should in, in my view so i think there's a there's a whole new challenge there in establishing a an enabling environment for these policies i say these policies is that groups of nations groups of states groups of blocks of states and i think that is very very important and while i don't 
I'm not suggesting the United Nations has a solution there yet, but I am suggesting that the SDGs provide a forum where this has to be discussed. This has to be raised, and I think the contribution of the resilience community to the Sustainable Development Goals is hugely, hugely important. At a, I suppose at a soft level, we have to there and consider, of course, apart from the disasters and, and scenarios you've just outlined, I think there's an ongoing uh, uh, challenge to enable resilience, for example, in, in community health globally. And of course, the health dimension of resilience is vitally important. But of course, this requires information, this requires data to be delivered, to be circulated, to be analyzed across the world. Currently, that is not possible. I think by the resilience community addressing it and creating this data environment to do that, I think it'll, be a, it'll really advance uh, uh, preparedness and uh, disaster responses in an ongoing way. Um, then one dimension that is coming, coming, I think becoming very important is the role of space. So currently, you know, we've got 180 or whatever your, uh, global space agencies pretty much operating independently. We have the United Nations body for outer space affairs. And by and large, this community has been you know, independent republics. So I think there's enormous potential for space-based assets to deliver enormous capability with regard to a permanent resilience capability and capacity. And I'm talking about engaging with these entities to design resilience capacity again, and I'm coming back to this theme of data enables capacity. And this time I'm talking about this capacity coming from, from space assets. And I think there's enormous capacity to do that. But of course, the only way that data solutions are going to be able to be delivered in many places that disasters take place is by space. It's not going to be by road, it's not going to be by telephone cables, blah, blah, blah. mobile telephony, yes, but space is going to be the enabler for that. And I think that's a, that's a huge chapter that still needs to be developed. And I think the time is ripe uh, to do that. So I'd really like to, to uh, uh, recommend that space is made a firm part of this discussion. And then I suppose a bit more at a practical level, and you've, 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 you've already introduced, introduced this idea, the, the research element. So how do we bring together the communities and stakeholders on an ongoing basis to do the research that is going to result in the innovations necessary to perform constant resilience capacity and capacity building? That has to be across nations. It has to be across disciplines. And again, it's going to be data enabled. But there needs to be initiatives to fund to regulate, to create the enabling policies to allow these collaborations to take place. And they have to be global. They have to be in what we currently call less developed nations, developing nations, and of course, developed nations. And when you subtract the OEC developed nations from the number of countries in the world, I think it's 190 or something, please correct me, somebody out there, a lot of nations. All these nations, again, to use the cliche, independent republics. That's not a lot of good if you want to build a global capacity of resilience. So how does that advance? And that's why I feel the conversation needs to be advanced at the level of the United Nations. And in particular, you will know that the United Nations is advancing this model concept of a global scenario for digital interdependence. And I think that's quite self-explanatory. But this digital interdependence initiative comes with an associated roadmap for digital cooperation, setting forward a number of years hence key milestones. Resilience is not on that. So I ask, could the resilience community represented here go forward, work with the UN on their digital roadmap for cooperation at global level and insert into that key mechanisms and milestones that would deliver this resilience capacity? of course, in collaboration with others. And I think the stakeholders here that are going to be necessary, and we'll hear a lot more about cybersecurity and other forms of security to support resilience, absolutely vital. I've also mentioned health, but then we also need to recognize the importance of environmental data, uh, uh, climate data, and of course, the interpretations and analysis of these developments. And again, that's all a data challenge. Okay. So then we need to see what does this data cruncher look like and what are the outcomes? And it's for the resilience community to design that. So I think there's, in conclusion, an opportunity here 
to use the existing mechanisms, principally at the UN level, to piggyback on existing established processes they have to advance awareness and needs of the resilience community in order to establish capacity and thereby looking in the immediate term at innovations in resilience that are going to make a difference in the addressing the challenges that you have. Right. Thank you very much, Declan. Very, very well put. And Claire, I would uh, love to ask your thoughts on resilience, of course, but would you please start out by telling us a bit more about the Institute for State Effectiveness? It seems to be a very virtuous organization, and I think we should all know more about uh, what you're doing there. Well, thank you. And I think I'm going to take us from the global to the country and the community level. So, but certainly, yes, the, the ISC is a think and do tank and uh, works in communities, um, helps to design platforms that help initiative scale, uh, and then also takes insights from what is and isn't working and tries to feed that back into tools and techniques and source books to make those available uh, to the broader community and to inform, I think, what we all now call the best fit rather than best practice, understanding the need for immense contextual adaptation. Uh, and, and we've worked in a number of places over the last um, decade, um, particularly in situations of crisis and crisis response, um, and have been able to and, and I'll start with you know, a, a major part of what we look at are the systems which are broken down into these stovepipes or the soda. So what are the systems of public health or the systems of public finance, of infrastructure? And as we know, they tend to be organized in country according to ministries or departments. And then the international community, in, including the United Nations and its UN agencies have also organized according to those stovepipes. Uh, and there's a reason for that. There needs to be specialization of knowledge and operations. Uh, but as we also know, it pre presents immense um, challenges of coordination and collaboration. So I think hence, hence our panel today. Uh, and as we all know, and when we get to the, the field level, um, you know, you can't have a public health, health system if your public finances aren't working. You know, your education system isn't gonna work if the infrastructure isn't there. So really trying to understand where are those interdependencies uh, and where are the points where those, the collaboration makes sense? Is it at the village level? Is it at a district level? Is it at a capital city level? Or is it at the UN level? So where do we need, where are those points of collaboration that need to take place? Um, I'll also say that a, a lot of our work is, is looking at platforms right at the community level, which is where Star Tides does a lot of its work. So uh, platforms where communities themselves can come together and collaborate. And for them, they don't organize in silos. They solve problems. And for them, they, you know, at the community level, it's much easier to take an integrated approach to water systems, to energy systems, to road and transportation. So we, we find that that, that that integration or the coordination is, is much easier at, at that level. So I thought I'd, I'd just share a few insights from, from our work to this question of sustaining resilience. Um, and, and the first is the need, you know, often the UN agencies have a practice of doing a needs assessment and that tends to document what isn't there. And we've proposed along with others of flipping that around and actually looking at the assets in place because often, now sometimes things will need to be brought in from the outside, but often a, a local community or region will have the assets in place that can be utilized, that can be leveraged, but people don't, it comes back to this data and data analysis question. Um, it's not recorded, it's not counted. So we propose this, this concept of, of asset maps, really to understand um, and prepare those data asset maps as well so that people can understand ahead of time uh, what, what is already in place so that there isn't always a scramble after a disaster to, to pull together the data and the information. And the uh, second is, um, is this question of, of the integrated approach. Again, it seems to be much easier to do at that local, at that community level. Um, but I think that now, and, and what we're talking about today, presents a real sort of design challenge or, or architecture. How do you combine um, the specialization that is necessary in the stove pipes with that integration. So where are those, what decision rights, what roles and responsibilities will be necessary um, across and among those, those stove pipes. And um, Declan, you just mentioned that the really crucial importance of um, data enabled research. So I think there's absolutely, there's a similar challenge. There's, you know, such an incredible amount of rich research in this field available, but a need for some kind of architecture to really understand um, how to use the existing data and data sets and bring the research community um, and, and bring the balance of all the 
brilliance that the research community can bring to bear with also understanding that the knowledge and the um, perspectives that exist already and can be generated by the people in the communities you know how do we bring those those two together great thank you very much claire mike would love your thoughts on resilience in a crisis environment of course but uh, you also would you please uh, give some insights into this organization the global cyber alliance and what your mission is and what you guys do sure. the uh, global cyber alliance is a uh, it's an NGO or a, a nonprofit that focuses on uh, cybersecurity issues. Uh, in particular, uh, three pillars or, or legs of the stool, if you will, um, <clears throat> focusing on bring, bringing together a variety of disparate communities uh, in order to address uh, systemic risk, risk issues, uh, producing actual concrete solutions that address those risks, uh, and then measuring the effect of that. So uh, it's not enough to make a thing and then throw it over the wall. Uh, it's important to make sure that for to to make sure that what you put into it uh, is is getting an exponential or hopefully exponential, um, uh, even if it's logarithmic <laughs> increase in value uh, uh, for what you've what you've done on the outside. So um, that's kind of GCA in a nutshell. Um, from a as you alluded to, I come from this uh, come to this problem from the perspective of of security uh, and particularly cybersecurity, and which is usually the thing that falls away as soon as a crisis <laughs> uh, uh, kicks off. Um, the security and protection and that sort of thing is, it falls away because people want to, um, people need to talk to each other, people need to access resources, uh, and security tends to be the barrier that gets in the way of you doing that, even under the best of circumstances. Um, resilience, the concept of resilience in this space uh, derives from uh, uh, something called the CIA triad, which is the work of a guy named Don Parker. Um, CIA stands for confidenti confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, when you get involved in security, uh, you start off focusing on the confidenti confidentiality and the in uh, integrity bit, because that's the, uh, that's the interesting and sexy parts. Uh, but the longer you uh, are in this business, the more you come to realize that it's the availability aspect uh, that is more important because confidentiality and integrity don't matter if you can't actually get at the, the data or the resources that you're trying to get at. This kind of this point is really driven home in the last something called ransomware. Um, the solution to ransomware, uh, the security needs to be more of the same. Uh, but actually, hostage is to have a recent copy of your data. Uh, that speaks to availability. <clears throat> that's not a security function. That's an administrative function. Um, so uh, resilience and security tend to go hand in hand. Uh, if you look at this, if you've been doing this for a long enough time, and you're looking at it from the right perspective and in the middle of the crisis uh, is, a, is a particularly challenging uh, issue um, and one that really can only be addressed by um, uh, practice. Um, practice doing things when things are working well, practicing when things are not working well and how do you, how do you uh, deal with those issues. Um, more to the point, it's not just a, th a discussion or, or an exercise that security people have to have or technology people have to have have. It's something that needs to permeate the organization because uh, when things are going well, it's pretend. Um, you don't, there are certain things that you don't have to do. Um, in crisis, you might have to buy something. Well, a security guy, you don't write checks. The IT guy might not check write checks. Um, there is probably an admin or a body that has to uh, authorize payment and that sort of thing. It's, it's, not, it's not just whipping out a credit card and, and off you go, um, particularly when you're talking about governments, um, government organizations. Um, so making sure that you involve all the people who might be involved <laughs> during a crisis and what has to happen is something that, that tends to fall away. We tend to fall in the security space. We tend to focus on security nerd things um, and, and, and just assume that it's, it's you know, this is big math problem with all, all these givens that we assume are gonna be working well for us uh, in a crisis. Uh, and that usually turns out to be, uh, to be not the problem because you don't have time to wait for the, the city budget meeting uh, or, or the state budget, uh, you know, legislature to get together. You might not be able to get the legislature together, so. How are you going to do this? All right. Thanks, Mike. And now, um, um, Mike, Declan, Claire, I'd like to transition to a few questions and answers. And uh, just as a, um, a note, 
not all of you have to address uh, the answer to every question. For example, I want to aim one to Declan on R&D, and then I'll ask Mike and Claire if you have any comments. Um, I'm going to ask Mike about uh, DNS, and it's something that uh, Declan and Claire, you don't have to feel obligated to talk about, but it's critical that we hit. Um, so first, let me jump in and say, um, Declan, I know you have a background in R&D and uh, tracking issues across borders and across communities. And wanted to ask if you could give us your thoughts on uh, what we can do to make R&D happen better before a crisis to improve resiliency. You know, that's a big part of what this whole Star Tides community is about. From my experience, increasingly, we're seeing a movement away from a bunch of people getting together with a particular budget over a particular period of time to do a particular research activity. Moving away from that to an environment where the research is more dynamic and ongoing and it's done on a infrastructure, a data infrastructure, for example. I'll give you one example. The European Union operates the biobanking and biomolecular resources research infrastructure. I don't make up the names, yeah. Also known as BVMRI. And this, as it says on the, is a biobanking capacity. But until this, if you wanted sample accesses, you'd have to ring around hospitals and wherever you think the samples might be that you want and try and get them. Now, it's accessible through this infrastructure kind of dial up for what you need. And that really advances the research capacity, the ability to do research in a sustained way, which is vital. That gets you out of the stop, start, stop, start, which is a problem. It's a problem in Europe. It's a problem in the US. It's a problem in Africa. It's a problem. And that just breaks, breaks down and it militates against cohesive collaboration. And I think this is the critical thing. So how do you build it? So in answer to your question, I think what's need, needed is a data infrastructure for resilience. I mean, that we need to define that, but we do that another time. Have that and then make that the global standard for resilience data, which then enables and encourages research activities on that data. And of course, these research infrastructures beget more data, they add to it, and on you go. And I think this is what's called sustainable research. And I think this is absolutely vital to prepare for any, any anticipated or indeed unanticipated disaster. And just my final point would be to say to you that if anything, the COVID situation has made policymakers, in my view, understand the need for standing capacity. You can't make this up from coal. Absolutely impossible. So it's got to be a permanent capacity. So I'm not sure if that contributes, but mm -hmm. that's what I would say. That's very good. And um, Mike, I'd like to ask you a question. Now, first of all, uh, feel free to comment on anything Declan said um, and anything else about R&D. But Mike, what I'd like to ask you about is this topic of DNS. And for context, DNS is the kind of thing that should be invisible to all human beings who connect to the internet. It works so well, you never have to pay attention to it. If you're in most countries, you order internet from an internet service provider and it just works. Your router just works with your phone and your TV and all your IoT devices and your computers. Um, and behind the curtains, there's this magic thing called DNS. And since it just works and since it's invisible, none of us pay any attention to it except increasingly cybersecurity professionals who have realized that if you manage DNS properly, you can improve resilience and you can make it harder on bad guys because if they have malicious code inside your infrastructure, they're trying to communicate. And if you manage DNS properly, you can make it harder on the bad guys to communicate, for example. So I'm thinking there's a problem with DNS since nobody has to understand it. Nobody pays attention to it. Um, in a crisis, you have all these people who are not technologists at all, just trying to survive. You have emergency responders coming in with new uh, technology. They just want it to work. They don't want to have to be thinking through all this stuff. Um, but if they knew a little bit about DNS, uh, they might be able to improve their resiliency 
and uh, improve their cybersecurity and mitigate a lot of risk. So I wanted to ask you, Mike, uh, please, any comments on that? And I know you guys do a lot of work with DNS stuff. Any tips or pointers on what first responders and the Star Tides community can do to learn about DNS? Sure. Um, so you're, you're right. DNS is, is for all practical purposes, magic. Uh, it, it just works. <clears throat> um, it, in a nutshell, DNS is the thing that translates or allows humans to better understand uh, uh, how to connect from one system to another over the internet. So um, today we all logged into uh, uh, uda.zoom.us. Um, uh, that is a, a easily human understandable translation of a series of numbers um, uh, that would otherwise that the computer uses to actually communicate back and forth. Um, if we had to type in uh, uh, DNS or, or IP addresses every time we wanted to connect to something, internet probably would not be as widely used as it is today. So um, <clears throat> the problem with DNS, of course, is anybody can stand up a, a computer system and, and get an internet connection uh, and register a, a domain um, and use that for, for whatever purpose they want by and large, uh, good things, um, but also very bad things. Um, one of the projects that the Global Cyber Alliance uh, put out uh, fairly recently is a project called Quad9. Uh, Quad9, uh, as the name implies, is using a DNS address of 9999. Uh, <clears throat> and it routes, you route your, uh, you configure your, your PC, your laptop, your phone to connect to uh, uh, quad nine. Quad nine handles, again, more magic, handles all the, you know, routing and, and, and filtering and making sure that um, the sites you connect to are, are uh, legitimate uh, and or non-malicious uh, is a probably better way to put it, um, sites. Um, there are other services that do this. Google has one. Uh, there are several other ones. You don't have to do it. It's not the law, uh, but it's one of those things that takes a whole class of, of problems off the table. Right, um, uh, trusting people uh, in the security space. There's a lot of you know trusting people, or, or we'll, we'll train people, we'll make them aware of things. It is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, after all. Um, but awareness only takes you so far, uh, and humans are notoriously unreliable uh, when it comes to security protocols. So uh, making one change and never have to, having to worry about it again is, is kind of a, is a great way of, of addressing risk at a, at a proper scale, which is kind of what we're all about. Uh, there is another related project in the works um, that will uh, coordinate the work of ISPs and registries and registrars uh, to help eliminate uh, or identify and eventually eliminate malicious uh, domains. Uh, if you're a bad guy, you register domains uh, by the thousands. Uh, and you, you use them as rapidly as you can because uh, eventually the good guys will catch you and they'll block those things. But it's, a, it's a, effectively a manual process and it is a, it is a stovepipe process because I'm a registry and I do, do it myself. You know, I'm a government agency, they, get, they do, it their, do it their way. There's no sort of brokerage um, uh, or exchange between those organizations. Uh, which is something that we're, we're trying to address. Um, uh, and to, to circle back to, to Declan's work, um, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of assembling all the right data in one place so that people can make smart decisions about what needs to be done. Um, that sort of thing applies uh, particularly in security uh, as well. So I, I, I'm, I'm glad to see things moving in that direction. Great, thanks, Mike. And Claire, I wanted to, of course, invite you to comment on anything they said, but I would also like to say you could think of what they just said as two categories of maybe thousands of things that could be thought through before a incident requires it to be done. And I was wondering if you could lead in the response to this question, and that is, are there broad principles that can be captured and taught before a crisis that will improve resiliency in communities and um, or any other views you have on how we might think through these problems in advance? Certainly, and there's been a real trend over the last few years um, towards getting ahead of the problem and um, to work on disaster preparedness, not just disaster response, and similarly in the conflict resolution field to work on put investment into conflict prevention rather than just conflict response and, and rebuilding. So that trend's already happening. Um, 
I was part of convening a meeting a few years ago where a number of heads of states looked at, we, we looked at the factors of governance or the, these different systems and their feedback from, and these are people who each had managed crisis and crisis response in their own societies. They said, look, we know we're going to get disasters. We're going to get floods or earthquakes or hurricanes. We don't know where, we don't know when exactly, but we know we're going to get them. We want to build in the systems, the processes, the capabilities within our own societies and not only rely on external actors to come in. So that, that trend's been underway for a while. Um, and I think a lot of investment has taken in, in already into the you know, rules and processes for decision making and a lot of you know, use of tabletop exercises and, and training together. So that's already underway. So on the decision making, um, I think one of the panelists already referenced the, the, the issue of financial flows and financial decision making. We all know that procurement processes take a long time in a disaster, those they need to be scaled up. And there's been a lot of work on, you know, what are the extraordinary rules and processes that need to be um, put in on an emergency basis. And I think also um, people having teams of first responders, but really, and, and I think this is where we're all gravitating today, where I think there's an enormous gap is on the question of information flows, on data information analysis and research. And I don't see that the same investment is taken in this field in preparing the um, investing in this area ahead of time. So this seems to be um, one of the really new frontiers. I think the other, I'll just mention one of the challenges, um, it's also using this perspective of risk analysis and, and reduction. Um, and where is it that risks can be identified ahead of time and mitigation measures put in place ahead of time. I remember working, for example, out in Nepal one time and um, for the want of an investment in repairing a dam that would have cost about somewhere between 20 and $80,000, um, a flood had occurred and it had ended up displacing hundreds of millions of people downstream um, and, uh, sorry, hundreds of thousands of people down, downstream and causing millions of dollars of damage. Um, so again, it's that, but had that risk identification been in place, um, it would have been a happier solution for everybody. But the incentives, as we know, for doing that prevention work is, is, is really tough. And it's no, well known in the diplomatic field that you're, you're not going to get the diplomatic uh, prizes for the prevention work. You, it's very hard to prove that you've prevented something that might have happened. So I think as well, thinking through this question of, of risk and incentive is, is also really important to this field. Great. Thank you, Claire. Um, Mike, I'd like to ask you a question. And you know, Declan mentioned when he was um, introducing his views on this concept, the issue of regulations. And we are increasingly in a global regulatory environment with the you know, EU's GDPR, the California Consumer Privacy Act, and uh, so many others of these popping up. And uh, this means privacy is an issue. And I was wondering if the Global Cyber Alliance um, has tips, techniques, best practices for protecting data from unauthorized use that might be relevant in emergency response? Well, uh, so to circle, you said best practice and, and to circle back to what Claire said earlier about best fit, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to read up on that and, and I'm totally going to steal that. So don't, don't be surprised. <laughs> um, from a, from a, yeah. So you, you put forth an interesting proposition. Um, the, the, the issue of, of privacy during a, during a crisis um, becomes a, a bit of a challenge, particularly in the, in the data, data online. Uh, you know, we give up, a lot of personal information already, right? So we have social media accounts and, and that sort of thing, and, and people reveal all sorts of things. So to a certain extent, um, that's stuff that um, you, you might not consider private, but under circum different circumstances, it pose, it, you could view, different, view that differently. Um, from, a, from a privacy standpoint, um, we, we don't have anything in, in particular uh, for, on an individual level, um, but we do, we do have a number of, um, uh, toolkits. Uh, we have a toolkit that we've assembled that has a number of different tools that people can use uh, on an individual basis. Uh, the, the specific tools of which uh, vary based on who you are and what you do for a living. So uh, from uh, we started off with, with folks in the small business space. Um, uh, we have, we have uh, variations on that theme for journalists, which is, is something that's being released uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, journalists around the world, you know, talking about resilience, talking about dealing with, with crises, uh, 
getting the word out about uh, a crisis and how bad it is, uh, what things are needed. Um, uh, that that's that we rely on journalists and reporters to do that sort of thing. Um, but those sorts of things could also happen in parts of the world where, where journalism uh, and, and how we view that in, in, in the US or, or Europe uh, is not viewed the same way uh, by the government. Um, uh, journalists are, are the enemy, uh, for, for lack of a better term. Um, so uh, all, all those sorts of things um, apply in a crisis. Uh, it's something that, that people need to be aware of. Uh, the, the, the needs or the requirements may shift uh, depending on the circumstances. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Declan, I would love your comments on any of that, but I also have a more specific question for you, and that is, um, in Claire's discussion, she raised this very interesting point about in many um, responses to disaster, um, you look at what's not there, and then you try to bring everything that is not there, but really what we should be doing is flipping that around a bit and looking at the concept of asset maps. What is there um, that can already be used and how do you optimize that? And I was wondering if you had views from an R&D perspective, uh, could that sh somehow shape uh, future R&D spins to develop new capabilities that will help us rapidly assess what is in a place uh, during a crisis and um, help us move to this concept of asset maps? Uh, absolutely, and and we we haven't, and maybe we should have uh, looked uh, in the time remaining. Look at look at the issue of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, federated machine learning, and I think these innovative tools, including blockchain, can really help us leverage existing knowledge assets and existing know how, and. I don't think the future is about reinventing wheels. Mm -hmm. For example, I, oh, I, 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 help, I encourage people to reflect on the fact that approximately, and again, I, anybody uh, listening to this is, is happy to correct me, but I, I think approximately 10 million patents go off patent every year. That is a vast amount of knowledge, which is by and large not used for a whole bunch of reasons, which is too, too much to go into in this conversation. So I think, it, no, absolutely, a lot can be done with existing assets, but for that to happen, again, with a nod to the enabling regulatory and policy environment, which we've had some discussions on, then how do you deploy machine learning on these assets to do A, B, and C? And I think that's what the research increasingly will be looking like. It's not going to be green field. It's going to be pr progressing existing knowledge contained in these in these in these assets in, in whichever form they are on i think that's absolutely vitally important to recognize but again this is not dealt with at policy making level hitherto so that has to happen at un level at block level wherever and this is the, this is the key problem is where do you where do you legislate where do you create the policy mechanisms i think this is a general point but as it pertains to enabling collaborative research and development to, to prepare for, for disasters and, and uh, related activities. This needs ongoing input, it needs ongoing research design, and it needs ongoing capability in the form of the machine learning, the data assets, and of course the human intervention to steer it left or right. And just uh, we have spoken about cybersecurity, and I, in all of this, let us not forget the importance of biosecurity for what I hope are the obvious reasons, because again, uh, looking at this particular pandemic of COVID-19 and previous uh, uh, developments uh, ar around uh, other, other minor uh, pan epidemics or, or, or uh, similar situations, these all require biosecurity to have a capacity in place, a biosecure capacity that can be deployed in a similar way as we've spoken here about other assets. So I, I, I think that would be a, a cause for optimism in terms of levering, leveraging existing knowledge and know-how for future capacity enabling. Wonderful. Well, uh, Claire, Mike, Declan, we have about um, you know, two minutes left and I wanted to ask each of you for final thoughts uh, that you would give the Star Tides community on ways we can better approach improving resiliency across the many stovepipes for those who need to 
respond in a, a crisis situations. Um, Claire, would you give us your thoughts on any final concluding thoughts for the community? Well, and, and really thank you, Bob, for convening this conversation. And I think from what's what's really emerged from this, certainly for me, is and if we do, you know, developing this asset mapping idea further, that there's just this, this tremendous amount of and when I use the term asset map, we're looking more at, you know, does the community have a well, what road network do they have? What human skills do they have? But extending that to look at um, the incredible amount of research that already exists that isn't tapped and is just sitting there unused. And in the context where I work, these reports, these you know, tremendous research has come, write reports, and then they proverbially sit on the shelf. So we built this, this research base um, that's, that's not tapped. And with now the, you know, the potential use of AI, um, it's there. So I think there's a, a tremendous sort of possibility that lies before us that the Startides um, group could take forward. Great, thank you. Declan, uh, final thoughts for the Star Tides community? Final thought will be to, I'd encourage the community to help policymakers decide on priorities and to ensure those priorities are reflected in future policies and associated regulations. I, I think that's what I would call for. Great, thank you. Mike, Great. any concluding thoughts for the Star Tides community? Yes, uh, resilience is not something, to the extent that I'm preaching to the choir, this is not something that you can, you can build uh, after things happen. You have to bake it into your processes uh, and procedures from the very, very beginning. More, just as importantly, you have to practice. You have to practice these things to a very granular level uh, or you're going to be surprised, uh, which is not something you want to have happen uh, in the middle of a crisis. Great, thank you. And I have a concluding comment for the entire community that I think the three of you just really underscored for me. And that is um, thinking through this in advance is important, but engaging with the community is also extremely important. Do that via any way you can, uh, interacting with star tides at events like this, or uh, writing and publishing your thoughts and getting your thoughts out there and uh, interacting with people that way. Please keep that up. And with that, thank you very much, panel. I really appreciate your uh, contribution in terms of thoughts and inputs. And please, let's keep the dialogue up.